Basically, I'm going to talk about, uh, so it's a case discussion. So it's one of our mistakes. I'm going to present one of our mistakes. So it's uh, always difficult to present mistakes, but I think we should present mistakes. Uh, so, so you will see. So uh, I have been asked to talk about examples of missed opportunity in avoiding long-term toxicity. I'm not going to talk about toxicity. I'm going to talk about comorbidity. Uh, so basically, this is Juan. So I use Juan because we are here. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's okay. Uh, Juan to, oh no, it's no. not okay. Juan is uh, okay. I understand. Juan is perfect. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 oh yeah, yeah. That, 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 uh, uh, so it's a 30-year-old MSM living in Paris. Uh, he works uh, as an air steward. He has multiple partners. Regular unprotected sex. Past history of anacondyloma, secondary syphilis. Uh, he was diagnosed HIV in 2014 with a CD4 cell count of 40, uh, 431 and a viral load of 30,000 copies. And he had primary uh, resistance, uh, so M184V and K103N. Uh, and you can see that he was uh, hip. B negative for all the tests, uh, Hep C negative. I haven't put it here, but Hep C negative, and uh, he had a past history of uh, syphilis. So uh, uh, he has just psychiatrist of serology. Um, so this is almost uh, I have adapted a little bit, but it's almost true. All this. Uh, so uh, he was actually because we don't do that that much. But because he had a primary resistance uh, uh, to uh, uh, efavirenz and to 3TCFTC, uh, by the clinician he was started on a darunavir, ritonavir, raltegravir. And you can see that this will have its importance. It's not, the idea is not to go that much on that, but you know that there was a study in naive patients on darunavir with raltegravir that was uh, published in Lancet, it is a European uh, uh, study that showed basically that uh, the, um, that, can I use this? No, okay, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That showed that virological response at 96 weeks is the same. However, it is the same when you are in patients with less than 100,000 copies and a CD for count of more than 200, we should be careful, really careful, using this uh, combination in patients with more than 100,000 copies. So I'm not going to go through that. That was not the case. I was just saying that this patient was on this regimen, and we don't use it that much, but probably adapted because he has less than uh, 100,000 copies, and we use that because of the primary resistance. So. In June 2016, during a regular follow-up, he was, of course, undetectable for, uh, hepatite, for uh, HIV with a high CD4 cell count, but we had a ALT uh, uh, and uh, uh, AZT increase. And uh, at that moment, so we, we, we diagnosed an acute HIV, HCV sorry, uh, uh, infection which probably many of you have in your clinics. Uh, he had at the same time uh, a chlamydia trichomatis and a gonorrhea uh, from, her, for, from his anal swab. Uh, so acute hepatitis C. This is not rare. Uh, so see, this is data uh, from Swiss cohort, and as you can see over time, we have had a huge and important increase in the incidence of hepatitis C in uh, uh, HIV-infected patients. The incidence is high, about uh, four per 100 person years. And as you can see, at least in Swiss cohort, it may not be the case everywhere, but the IDUs are, are, are having the inverse trend. Uh, so the questions, and of course this is very high in patients who had the syphilis. So the question, the first question I think that is very important, because we're talking, talking, talking about comorbidities, 
uh, and toxicities. But I think this kind of comorbidity is also important. So, the, and, and the, the first question is that now we are starting to follow much less our patient, to see every six months. Uh, so should we have a different follow-up for STIs and hep C and hep B? We will come back to that in these patients, in MSMs. Uh, do you propose in your clinics a regular follow-up uh, every six months, every three months? Um, so uh, there are some papers, few, very few, on how often uh, and how to screen for hep C. Uh, it could be symptom-based when your case became symptomatic, which is, I think, not good. It could be based on uh, liver function test, ALT, AZT. It could be on uh, HCV antibodies and HCV RNA. So this study was published, it's from the US in 2012. And so this, I'm not going to go in detail, but this is a cost effectiveness analysis to see how often you should screen your patient. I'm just going to emphasize on two. Uh, they show in their study that uh, doing uh, liver function test every six months and HCV every year is probably cost effective because that's cost effective. And doing every three months the same thing is probably not cost effective because it's more than 100,000. However, we should be careful. This slide shows that you can see that the three month strategy with liver function tests will be probably cost effective if the incidence of your uh, HCV is more than 1.2 per 100 cases. It means that in a patient who has a history of syphilis, of gonorrhea, which is lots of our patient, probably we should screen him for hep C every three months which is not the case right now. I think recommendations are every six months. And in addition, this study was done at a period where we were using four treatment peg riba and where transmission of HCV was not considered. I think with new treatments, much more efficacious, we re should really, really screen much more frequently HCV. And this is one of the first uh, uh, points I wanted to make. This is a study published in CID this year by uh, uh, Natasha Martins that you can see that if you don't treat your HCV, the prevalence and the incidence of HCV in MSN are going to go up in HIV. Even if you treat them with peg riba, it's going to go up. These are, these are different DAAs. With DAAs, if you treat them, they're going to come down. And uh, I think we should emphasize on this. So for this, we should screen them. This was a modeling study we did. If you screen your patients uh, uh, every three months, you will diagnose your hep C infection 91 days after infection. If you do it every six months, it's almost... Uh, uh, the double. And during this period, the patient doesn't know he's undetectable for HIV and transmit HCV to the others. The other question that actually I do not agree with the recommendation that's going to change probably soon is if you screen a patient, is for treating him at the acute stage. Do you treat your patients at the acute stage? I think, but I may be wrong because this is moving fast, but at least uh, two months ago, and I, I didn't see anything, the European recommendation is still to do this, you know, you have acute HCV, you do the DK, if it's less than two log, you treat, if it's more than two log, you don't treat, etc. until if it's, it's decreasing, you don't treat, if it's stable, you treat. I think probably this should change. We should probably treat everyone. Uh, 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 why people say, some people they say you should not treat because they said that early treatment will no longer confer a traffic clearance advantage over treatment. In chronic infection, you have the same efficacy. 
Uh, that's why U.S. recommendation, I think that's not changed yet, but I think it's going to change soon, say that until data documenting the efficacy and the safety of treatment uh, with interferon sparing therapy are available, monitoring for spontaneous clearance for a minimum of six months is recommended. When decision is made, treatment as prescribed for chronic. But I think we should treat because treatment of acute may remain more cost effective because maybe shorter duration, maybe, because people, if you don't treat them, you can lose to follow up those patients. And I think the main, main, main issue is transmission. And that's why actually the European last year recommendation is to treat those who transmit. And the French recommendation is the same thing. And for that now we have this study that actually was presented by Jorgen last year at the CROI uh, uh, of, for example, Ledipesvir, Sofuspebe for six weeks, although six weeks may not be enough, especially with those with high viral loads, with good results, although I think we may have better results. But now we start having better results. So I think the first thing is that you should certainly monitor frequently your patient at high risk STD for hepatitis C. And the second uh, is probably you should treat it. And at least in France, now we can do it. Uh, so what we decided, this patient in July, when we <coughs> saw him, because we didn't know about this, but you don't know every patient in your clinic, but when we decided to treat the hep C, hep C, we found out that the HBV is negative. No vaccination. So, of course, you should vaccinate this patient. We said you should vaccinate this patient. But before vaccinating this patient, we did a, a HB S antigen and HPV viral load, and he was positive. And one month sooner, he was he was negative. So, so when I said mistake, so mistake. However, so I I don't know this topic very well. So because of this case that was last month, and because of today, I try to really go through the, to this. So first of all, first of all. Uh, the incidence of HPV in HIV MSMs is high. I was very surprised, to be honest, to see this. I would not imagine that the HPV, uh, uh, so this is a study which is uh, done in Germany, so probably, uh, probably you know it, and, uh, uh, it, done in Germany, you can, you can probably comment later, but in Germany, uh, plasma sample collected yearly screened for HPV, HCV, and syphilis, and was never imagining that we have a three per 100 person years of HPV acute infections, more than HCV although we have a vaccine. This is in the US, so it's the max court, the great max court. Uh, so MSMs, and what you can see is that we have the same almost incidence uh, with uh, here in patients with no hearts at about 1.5 1, 1 or 15 per, 1,000 or 100, you can see that it's much higher in patients who are not in heart, and it's much lower in patients who are on art and undetectable. And I will come back to that. Uh, and of course, it's lower in HIV and affected. So in this study, they found, I'm sorry it's small, but I'm going to emphasize risk factors or risk factors for acute hep C a beep, sorry, a beep, was young, being young. Second, to have multiple sexual partners. Third, to have not received a dose of vaccine, of course. And fourth, to not be undetectable. If you were undetectable, you have a 80, for HIV, you have a 80% uh, uh, more uh, 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 chance to not be infected. So I will come back to all this, but first, the incidence, it, I was very surprised to see it. It's so high. 
And of course, the first protective factor is vaccine. So this is risk factors. We cannot make people younger or older. Uh, we can, but difficult to say you should decrease your sexual partners or you should, uh, but we can vaccinate them. So this is the easiest. So what is the coverage? This is a study from, uh, from Eurocida, I think, actually. In 2015 or 16, it was published, 16. So it's new in BMC infectious disease. So I know that we have people from Eastern Europe here. So what you can see, HPV vaccination, what you can see is it's 35% of HIV infected patients are vaccinated against HPV in Eastern countries. For uh, non-East Europe, 85%. It's not good, still not good, but I think it's overestimated because it's particular centers. In, in, in this study uh, from Germany that I presented, what they show is it's only 47% of patients in Germany are effectively vaccinated. In Germany, imagine elsewhere. Uh, because you're good usually for this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, although we should consider that 23%. So it's not good at all. It's not good at all. And in the US, it's even worse. In the US, it's even worse. So this was a study, I think, in I don't know how many uh, uh, HIV clinics in the US. And again, what you can see is vaccinated with more than one dose, 24%. So I really think it's big issue, big, big, big issue. We are talking about very complicated things. This is easy. This is easy and it's really an issue. So the other thing is that we should be careful because immunogenicity of hep B vaccination in adults is lower uh, uh, in HIV infected adults. It's lower than in, it sh this should be in non-HIV infected adults, sorry. So you can see this is uh, actually when you do three doses, okay? What, what you can see, intramuscular three doses, as it is, uh, as it is uh, 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 recommended. And what you can see is that n not everyone will be immunized at 28 weeks. Uh, and uh, it is dependent of age, those who are older or less immunized, and it is, of course, dependent on the CD4 second. If you have higher, you have better immunogenicity. Uh, that's why now you have different type of vaccination, not to do 23 times, 20 micrograms three times, which is the, what we use usually, but now probably the, the one which is more recommended and I checked with the EAX, is 40, four times, specifically if you have low CD4s, specifically if you are older, okay? And th you have also intradermal, which is a little bit more difficult and, and a little bit uh, less protective. What are the, uh, what are the uh, predictive factors for response? So, Basically, I wanted to emphasize on one, which uh, females, for reasons, are, are, are responding better. Uh, I s talked about uh, the different ways of s vaccinating. Uh, uh, smoking is bad with everything. Uh, and then, uh, if you are undetectable, and that we will come back, if you are undetectable, it's much better. When you are not undetectable, you have 60% less chance to respond, which is huge. Although this is a very bad thing, because the physician we had, I asked her with the patient, I asked her, why didn't you vaccinate it? And she said, I was waiting for the patient to be indetectable to vaccinate, and then I forget. So I think that it, 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 we should be careful about this issue, high CD4, low CD4, undetectable, undetectable. I think in a person in risk, we should vaccinate, maybe with a different strategy, which is what recommended. If you have low CD4, maybe four doses, double doses. 
that should be recommended. The other thing is that we should be careful because the re duration of response is, is not that high. This, you can see, this is the, the strategy that we use uh, frequently, three times, 20 micrograms, and you can see that over time it decreases. It decreases, for example, here we have, this is at 28 weeks, this is at month 42, and you can see that 30% of people have lost already. So what can we do for that? First of all, that means that we should, we don't do that at all. I don't know if you do it, but we don't do it that often. Is that you should regularly monitor your HPS antibody response. Do you do it? Who does that? One, don't be shy. If you do it, it's good. Oh, I, I, I'm sure they. <laughs> yep. now, now the fingers keep up. <laughs> yeah, but we. I think we should do it. That's easy. We should do it. And uh, and, and and if it's not possible, what people say is that probably you should do a booster to see if it goes up. And if it's not going up, a new vaccination cycle. And the new vaccination cycle, actually. Some people say that you should not do standard, but uh, double dose uh, uh, vaccine HP, uh, uh, hepatitis strategy. Uh, that is, I think, the British guideline is double dose for those who do not support. But for example, this study that showed that there is no difference. So there, that there are some debates. I have to finish. I just wanted to go back to the fact that in their study from Max published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, they found that low viral load, less than 400, is pro, uh, in, in these patients, the acute hepatitis B is much less frequent, so protective. Why? Basically, there are two reasons, and probably two reasons. One reason is those with an effective heart less than 50, uh, have an immune response that substantially decrease the risk of productive HPV infection. They don't do a productive HPV infection. That, and that's, uh, for example, related all the immunity and the increase to absolute counts of memory CD4 T cells. The other, the other thing is that, that we all have heard studies, etc., is that Within our HIV drugs, we have HBV active drugs that reduce the risk of incidence HBV infection. I always finish in three minutes. Uh, so you know this study presented at the CROI, published in AIDS uh, 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 by our uh, 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 colleagues from Netherlands. Patients were selected retrospectively for negative HPV serology, MSM with a second HPV available were included, and then they look at the incidence of HBC conversion, and what they can see is that those who were in blue, blue, no HIV active drug, they have in 40% of cases, 35% of cases, an acute HPV infection. Those who were on HPV active drugs less often, and especially if they were with TDF. I think this is this should be 40 40 percent were. So the protective effect of so basically the the reason I present this patient was that he was on Darunavir and Raltegravir, and the idea was probably that is the reason he didn't have. So I think we should be very careful. And I checked in the EX guidelines. They have now noted if you want to switch to a new free regimen, you should check again for hep C. So monitoring HP, uh, HPV serology should be even more important. However, I'm going just to throw this because I didn't know at all this, but the in, in the Anna's paper, they debate the fact that TDF or 3TC or FTC protect against HPV. So I discussed this and we can have a discussion. I was very, very surprised to find that. I didn't know that. What they say, and it's an analysis paper, they put in vitro studies, they said 
The first step in HPV infection is transfer of the HPV genomic to the hepatocyte nucleus to establish the reservoir of convalently closed circular DNA from which transcription occurs. It's reasonable that anti-HPV drugs do not prevent new infection because they do not interfere with that step. They just decrease the replication. I'm not, I'm not sure this is true. I was surprised to find that. Anyway, I just wanted to finish by saying vaccination. Thank you.